All right, enough homework. What do dogs and canaries have in common? I'll be telling you in this lecture all about the Canary Islands and focusing on Tenerife, which we're going to visit next Sunday. My name is Sandra Etlinger, and uh, I've been pushing my website, which is on the bottom of the slide, and also my email address. Love to hear from you, always happy to do so. And uh, also, when we're out and about on the ship, I've asked people to give me a thumbs up, and if you can't see who I am, you know what a thumbs up is, uh, to let me know that you've been to my lecture and that you like what I'm doing for you. Uh, helps me know that I'm on track and helps me prepare my material for the next lecture as well. Let me start with some words. If you attended any of my previous lectures, you know that I'm a storyteller, so let me begin with one of my favorite stories. Tom and I had just boarded a ship, and we went up to dinner that evening. Our wait uh, staff person came, and he was wearing a sign, a little name tag, and on the name tag, that's what was written. And I looked at it, and I thought a minute, and then I just said to him, your name is adorable? And uh, he kind of grinned. And uh, I'm sure somebody had asked him this question before, and he just very quietly said, adorable. <laughs> and this is the problem we have with language. As an English speaker, uh, when I get to some place like Cadiz, which uh, some people call Cadiz. Um, it all works as long as we're able to communicate. And so I try to get the words correct, but there's one person's correct and somebody else's correct, so we do our best. While we're talking about names, let's talk about how the Canary Islands got their name. First of all, you may be surprised to learn that the Car Canary Islands are not named after the canary bird. The Canary Island coat of arms helps us to understand this naming mystery. The ribbon at the top says Oceano because they are islands located in the Atlantic Ocean. The crown represents the king of Spain. Since there are seven main islands, and we're going to talk about them all, there are seven symbols on the shield. But what about the dogs? This is the Canary Islands. Why are there two dogs and not two canaries? If you studied Latin at all, you might reasonably point out that the Latin word canary means to sing. So it must follow, mustn't it, that this little songbird takes its name from that sing-songy verb that also gives us canto and cantata, only it doesn't. The words may look and sound like lexical kissing cousins, but they come from totally different word families. You'd be right on the money, though, if you guessed that the canary bird hails from the Canary Islands. It does. But if you were then to jump to the conclusion that the islands must be named after the bird, you'd have it backwards. That's right. The little yellow birds weren't the only native species to grace the archipelago. Also sharing the islands when the Romans came were native people, and they worshipped dogs. They worshipped them to the point of mummifying their remains. The Romans called these dog worshippers the ones with dogs, and the island on which they found them the island of dogs. Some believe the Romans might have named the islands after a species of now extinct monk seal that lived on the Grand Canary Island. And so, as we near the end of this wild canary chase, we see that canary birds are named after the Canary Islands, which are named after canary dogs or canary monk seals. So to recap, Canary has much in common with birds, dogs, islands, people, and seals, but absolutely nothing to do with singing. Now, we've looked at some names, so let's look at some numbers. 
Population growth in the Canary Islands has increased over the years with more than two million current residents. Tenerife and Grand Canary Islands have the bulk of the population. There's a five hour time difference between San Juan, where we embarked, and Tenerife. When it's noon in San Juan, New York and Florida, where I live, it's 5 p.m. in Tenerife. That means we'll have several time changes between now and next Sunday. Canarian time is one hour behind that of mainland Spain, and the same as that of the UK, Ireland, and Portugal all year round. While the majority of the Canary Islands population is Roman Catholic, fewer than 50% of the Canarios turn up for Sunday Mass, but all of them are baptized and they all have church weddings and funerals. Canarios are not orthodox and rigid. They are a friendly people who have their social meetings on the streets, and they are Mediterranean in the sense that they start their day late and take an afternoon siesta from 2 to 5 p.m., after which they put in a few hours at work. They socialize till late in the night. Tenerife is most famous for its year-round sunshine and black sandy, sandy beaches, but beneath the surface you'll find historic towns, dramatic landscapes, and plenty of culture on this wonderful volcanic island. Cruise ships berth on the northeast coast in the capital, Santa Cruz de Tenerife's bustling natural harbor. And even if you are the furthest ship from the entrance, it's no more than a 15 minute walk and there are shuttles. According to my sources, our sister ship, the Grandeur of the Sea, who has been following us or we're following them, will also be in Tenerife that day. But as far as I can tell, we are the only two cruise ships, big ones, scheduled for that day. There may be some locals, but we're the only majors that will be there. The busy fishing port surrounded by mountains is one of the deepest in the world and is less than a kilometer from the city center. This makes it an easy place for passengers to disembark. The economy is based primarily on tourism, which makes up 32% of the gross domestic product. So a third of their GDP comes from you and me. The Canaries receive about 12 million tourists per, per year, and 4 million of them come by cruise ship. Construction makes up nearly 20% of the GDP, so it's really growing. And tropical agriculture, primarily bananas and tobacco, are grown for export to Europe and the Americas. Ecologists are concerned that the resources, especially in the more arid islands, are being overexploited. But there are still many agricultural resources like tomatoes and other similar crops. The islands experienced continuous growth at a rate of approximately 5% annually, fueled mainly by huge amounts of foreign direct investment in tourism real estate. The EU allows the Canary Islands government to offer special tax concessions for investors with a fixed rate of only 4% compared to the European average of between 25 and 30 percent. So the uh, numbers don't lie, and that certainly explains why there's so much growth there. The Canary Islands have great natural attractions, climate and beaches, which make the island a major tourist destination. Mount Tady receives nearly three million visitors every year. The visitors are about evenly divided among Spanish non-residents, Germans, British, and others. While the Canary Islands are really part of Spain, they're located closer to the African coastline than to the Spanish one. There's only 60 miles separating them from the Moroccan coastline. There are seven main Canary Islands. And uh, let's just explore a tiny bit of their history. One significant facet, facet of the Can Canary Islands history is the story of the Juan Shea. Please understand that I am not a scholar, but I can share some of the stories that are told to explain the origin of this mysterious group 
who were the indigenous people of the Canary Islands. It's generally agreed when the islands were visited by the Europeans that they met a tall, fair-haired race of Neolithic people. While it's unknown for sure how they arrived on the islands, what is known is that they shared a number of cultural characteristics with the ancient Egyptians and that their building style appears to have been replicated in South and Central America, which is astonishing when you consider the times when these things were built. These early inhabitants relied on limited farming, herding, hunting, and gathering for their subsistence with a staple diet of flour made from the roasted grains which are still found locally today. Many mummies have been found showing that the Huanche embalmed their dead. The corpses on display in the National Museum are estimated to be between 600 and 1,000 years old. Combined with the existence of the pyramids at Guimar, this has proved an intriguing riddle to some historians. We will be visiting only one of the Canary Islands, but I'd like to review them all in case you want to return someday, and also to share a few of my favorite stories about them. And again, when we look at the culture of all the islands together, it helps us to uh, understand what we're going to be seeing on Tenerife. So we'll begin with Tenerife, because I know that's what attracted most of you to my lecture. And uh, if there is any spot on the globe that enjoys a perfect climate, Tenerife is that spot. Average temperatures, summer and winter, hover between 59 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and there's only very occasional rain. This holiday paradise includes verdant forests in the northern part of the island, as well as mountains, deserts, volcanoes, exotic plant, and animal life. There's spectacular beaches with black volcanic sand. And Tenerife offers the unique experience of swimming and sunbathing on a beautiful beach, while just a few miles away, snow sparkles on the crest of Mount Tady. The island's central mountain stands at 12,200 feet, the highest in Spain. And a cable car ride to the summit offers unrivaled views of lunar-like landscape of the volcanic slopes. Tady National Park was declared a protected area in 1954, and it offers one of the most spectacular landscapes of the world, including an enormous volcanic crater with a circumference of 30 miles. Winter in the park brings snowfall and gale force winds, while in summer, temperatures can soar to above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. This time of year, will enjoy the perfect climate in this area because it's not too hot there yet. The island's capital is an upbeat town geared for tourism, uh, Santa Cruz de Tenerife, and there's another Santa Cruz in the islands as well. Its port, where once the first shots of the Spanish Civil War were fired, is today a morass of ferries, jet foils, and freighters. A tourist office is conveniently located in Plaza España, right near the port. The main square is the heart of the city, and it includes an artificial lake. The square was originally built in 1929 on the site of the historic San Cristobal Castle, and it was completely remodeled in 2008. When you go there and you're in the square, look around down below the square, uh, some of the original walls of the castle are on display in a tunnel that goes under the square. So if you're there on your own, don't miss that tunnel. It's kind of interesting to see those original walls. If you want to confine your visit to Santa Cruz, where we dock, a good choice is to use the city sightseeing bus, which visits 13 venues, one of which is located right next to Plaza España. Stop number 10 on the route is El Corte Anglais, Spain's biggest and best department store, where you will find everything from the latest in men's underwear styles to demonstrations of local crafts. 
The city is also served by an efficient tram service, and tickets between buses and trams are interchangeable. Near the department store is one of my favorites, the Santa Cruz Auditorium, which stands prominently northeast of the Marine Park. I can't go there without capturing at least another dozen images or so on my camera. Its architect is Santiago Calatrava, one of the architects who designed the spectacular City of Arts and Sciences in Valencia, Spain, shown here. And if you've never been to Valencia, sooner or later you ought to try and get a cruise that goes there. The, the architecture and the buildings that you'll find in Valencia are really world-class, and it's a magnificent place. Tom and I, as I mentioned this morning, have an apartment for a week after we disembark, and so we hope to spend some quality time there. Not far from the dock is Our Lady of Africa Market, a local market where you can inhale the local culture and where people watching reigns supreme. Popularly known as the Rekova, which means archway, this market has a Central America feel with its clock tower that has been around since the 1940s and is fairly easy to find if you're anywhere in the area because the clock tower sticks up and directs you. Here you'll find really fresh fruits and vegetables and flowers for sale, or uh, they're always nice to photograph. And also there's a mall with more than 40 stores that feature fashion, accessories, jewelry, and more, many of them local. Because we're going to be there on a Sunday, you are in for a special treat. The Santa Cruz Sunday morning market from 9 until 1.30 has everything from African drums to zinnia plants. Browse the hundreds of stalls in air that's perfumed with patchouli oil and hot dogs. For me, it's not so much a market as it is a happening. And you may even find some, inter some interesting things to take home with you. Because Tom and I live in Florida, near a very world-class beach, we almost never spend time on the beaches when we travel, but I know that some of you may want to do that. So locals tell me that Terracitas is one of their favorite beaches in Tenerife. It's located seven kilometers north of the city. And uh, again, that's, that's conjecture. Uh, somebody else will tell me that, no, that's not their favorite beach, there's another one, but more people have talked about it uh, than others. Many tons of sand from the Sahara were shipped over to create this beach with a breakwater that makes it ideal for both swimmers and sunbathers. If nature is more your thing, take a break from the bustle of the city by relaxing in the beautiful gardens of Garcia Park. It's stop number six on the city bus tour. The best way to explore is to begin at the floral clock and follow the spiral path which reveals its treasures as it meanders in ever-decreasing circles towards the park's center. Sculptures, floral arches, lily ponds with frogs, locals performing gentle aerobics, tropical plants squabbling parrots, an emerald bamboo tunnel, fountains, and quirky touches assault your senses at every single step. Along the way, benches provide welcome spots to contemplate the many wonders all around. That's one of the beauties of this park. It can be different things to different people. A subtropical botanical garden, an outdoor art gallery, or just a delightful space to stop and recharge your internal batteries. For those of you interested in history, the Museum of Nature and Man is the place for you. This museum is packed full of relics, pictures, videos, and displays about the archaeology, flora, fauna, and anthropology and sociology of the Canary Islands. This is where you'll find displays of the Huan Che mummies, along with other items used by these people who lived on the islands before the Spanish conquest. Situated in a most attractive former hospital with a galleried courtyard, this museum deals seriously, but accessibly, with the archaeology, anthropology, ethno ethnography, and natural history 
of the Canary Islands. For those of you who want to get out and about, there are a few interesting places near Santa Cruz which you can visit. <coughs> These include Puerto de la Cruz on the northwest coast, Candelaria, and uh, Guimar, both of which are located south of Santa Cruz. While the safest and easiest way to visit these venues is to book one of Royal Caribbean's great shore excursions, and Tom and I are often on those excursions ourselves, the adventurous among you may want to check out the Tenerife bus service, which covers every corner of this island. You can either pay for each individual trip or buy a bus pass for 12 or 30 euros. These passes can be used on every route, they can be shared between several people, and they save about 50% on the single price of a ticket. If you do use the bus system, make sure that you plan on coming back to the ship plenty early. You don't want to run into the problem of traffic uh, and or a breakdown, and sometimes a bus is full and it goes right by you without stopping. Puerto de la Cruz was originally developed to export sugar and wine to the New World. Today, the harbor remains a center of activity with a line of food stalls serving traditional Canarian food. Puerto's main church dates from the 17th century, and its interior is among the most beautiful on Tenerife. Perched on a hill above the town is a former casino and hotel a vast waterfall cascades down through abundant terraces below, and there is a wonderful botanic garden behind the hotel. Winston Churchill and Agatha Christie stayed there in its heyday, and plans are in motion to restore it to its former glory. On the outskirts of Puerto, you'll find Parrot Park, a zoo reserve of animal and plant species. The park was initially conceived as a paradise for parrots, and it's developed into one of the Canary Islands' biggest attractions today. Think SeaWorld with birds. About 20 kilometers south-southwest of Santa Cruz and accessible by the number 122 bus is uh, Candelaria, and its beautiful basilica, which dates back only about 50 years. It's dedicated to an apparition of the Virgin Mary that's called the Virgin of Candelaria, who is most often pictured as a black Madonna. Candelaria also has an interesting line of aboriginal sculptures along the shoreline. One of the most intriguing and controversial venues in Tenerife are the Step Pyramids. They are located less than 30 kilometers from Santa Cruz, where our ship, ship is going to dock. Now, Tenerife's pyramids aren't quite like their Egyptian cousins. In looks terms, the English pyramids, the Egyptian pyramids are George Clooney, whereas Weimar's are Woody Allen. <laughs> they're not particularly stunning to look at, but they're fascinating nonetheless. Kimars are step pyramids, similar to those that Tom and I saw a few months ago in Peru and Mexico. As a matter of fact, they're, they're astonishingly similar. And this is a fact that Norwegian adventurer Thor Heyerdahl used to support his theories relating to the migration patterns of ancient civilizations. Now, Heyerdahl himself is very controversial. Um, some say that he challenged the established order and that he attracted controversy throughout his entire life. He wasn't part of the established scientific community, so some people think that his theories are just bunk. His claims that Guimar's pyramids were built by the Wanshe have ignited heated debate on Tenerife for decades. Heyerdahl also believed that an ancient race could travel across the Atlantic on a reed boat, and he built one to try to prove it. So why the fuss? Are the pyramids real, or are they just an elaborate hoax for tourists? Well, there are always two sides to every story. Supporters of their authenticity point out 
that Gimar was a Wanche stronghold. Even by the earliest 19th century, if outsiders visited a sacred Wanche site without permission, the chances are that they'd end up in the local stew pot. There's undisputed evidence of a Wanche settlement on the actual site of Gimar. The Wanche were sun worshippers, and the pyramids are laid out so that they are perfectly aligned with the summer solstice sunset. The rocks used for the pyramids have been carefully laid with a flat side facing out, and they've been trimmed so that they fit perfectly together. The naysayers, on the other hand, claim that the pyramids are a work of fiction, which are a hoax constructed for tourism. Some claim that the stories only date from the 19th century and that they are nothing more than discarded farmers' rubble. And others claim that the land on which the pyramids set was about to be developed for housing when Heyerdahl put forth his theories. So, if you owned land primed to be the next hot property development, would you want it to turn out to have archaeological significance? If you want to explore this entire subject in more depth, you might enjoy a visit to the Ethnographic Park Museum at the Pyramid site. Among other exhibits, it has a life-size replica of Heyerdahl's reed ship, the Contiki. Okay, let's look at some of the other islands. Um, several of them interesting and uh, several of them where cruise ships go on other itineraries. Lanzarote was formed by volcanic eruptions. The very earth is turned inside out. More than a third of the island is covered by black lava. Streams of lava, hardened over the years, thread their way through the barren earth. Nature is still a big attraction on this small volcanic island. Camels are often used to transport goods and sometimes tourists across the dry volcanic ash that covers most of the landscape. UNESCO declared the whole island a biosphere reserve in 1993. What's a biosphere reserve? It's an area that seeks a balanced relationship between man and nature. Benefits gained from being part of the network include the improvements of conservation and scientific research. Lanzarote's capital is a small town on the eastern coast. Its harbor is packed with fishing boats. Modern art in an old building works well in the capital, where a collection of works by international artists is on permanent display in a fortress built more than 200 years ago by the King of Spain. Artists featured are Bacon, Picasso, Miro, and others. Timanfaya National Park is unique because it's the only national park in the world to have been developed by local residents. Also unique is a volcanic field filled with a variety of geological and geothermic phenomenon. And if you want a hot lunch, you can enjoy a meal cooked on geothermal heat, which comes from the geysers and the steam vents. In the northern part of Lanzarote is a spectacular system of underground grottos. This is one of the largest volcanic galleries in the world, formed about 5,000 years ago in a prehistoric eruption. Another spectacular site, one that I really go crazy with with my camera uh, on Lanzarote, combines art with nature, where one can see more than 10,000 cacti in a converted quarry. Only 60 miles separates the second largest of the Canary Islands from the continent of Africa. The island is relatively undiscovered. It's more than 150 idyllic sandy beaches, only sparsely populated, and many seldom visited by anyone at all. The island has an arid volcanic landscape, and apart from the beaches, not much to recommend it in the way of tourist amenities or attractions, and sometimes those are the best places to go. They're still in their natural state. This has kept the mega resorts and mass summer holiday trade at bay, but it does have a fair share of day trippers from the resorts of Lanzarote and Gran Canary who come seeking a respite from the crowds on those islands. 
Fuerteventura is easily accessible from the other islands in the archipelago by ferry or by air. The main town was once called Goat Harbor, and even today it's said that goats outnumber the people in this whitewashed town. Only recently, capitalizing on the tourist trade, the streets in charming Puerto del Rosario have been resurfaced and the harbor promenade rebuilt. They want the cruise ships to come there too. Without a doubt, the most beautiful village on the island has not changed its appearance at all since it was founded in the early 15th century. A highlight is the Church of Santa Maria and the Archaeological Museum. The third largest but most developed of the seven islands in the Canaries, Grand Canary, has been billed as a miniature continent because of the variety of climates and landscapes that it offers, from the big city bustle of the capital Las Palmas to the serenity of its lush woodlands. Grand Canary is almost circular, with a diameter of about 32 miles, and it's characterized by deep ravines that radiate out from the center down to the coast. The north of the island is humid, boasting green valleys and volcanic craters, while the south is arid and desert-like with vast stretches of beach. The capital lies on the northeast tip of the island between two long beaches, and it boasts an important historical and cultural heritage in its old town, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Centrally located, Plaza Santa Ana has its entrance guarded by bronze dog statues, and now we know why there are dogs. And these symbolize not only the name of the Canary Islands, but the legendary canine, which since 1506 was said to have appeared in the town's heights. In this area, you will find impressive historical buildings, such as this largely 17th century building serving as the resident of the president of Grand Canary's High Court of Law, the elegant 19th century building of the town hall, and the imposing Santa Ana Cathedral. The main museum in Las Palmas boasts the world's largest collection of Cro-Magnon skulls. It also gives a comprehensive overview of the life and times of the island's original inhabitants, the fair-haired, light-skinned people who were conquered by the Spanish in the 15th century. The aboriginal people are represented in a beautiful monument which symbolizes their resistance against the Spanish invaders. Christopher Columbus is believed to have stayed in the historical quarter on his way to Americas, a complex of traditionally built houses forming a typical Canarian village features gates, turrets, and an atrium. Designed in the 1930s, this village boasts a large central square surrounded by shops selling local handcrafts where regular shows of Canarian music and dance take place. The interior of Grand Canary has steep highlands dotted with small villages, sporting white houses with red roofs, banana plantations with papaya trees, and orchards bursting with tropical fruits. You can take a voyage to the bottom of a dormant volcano or enjoy the spectacular views from the peak formed by the crater's lava flow. Tourists generally favor the so southern coastline, flocking to the well-known beaches where the sea washes soft sands and empty dunes stretch for miles. La Homera is the volcanic origin and a roughly circular. It's about 15 miles in diameter, and it rises to nearly 5,000 feet. Its shape is rather like an orange that has been cut in half and then split into segments, which has left deep ravines, which are covered by the laurel rainforests. The inhabitants of La Homera have a unique way of communicating across the deep ravines. This whistled language is indigenous to the island, and its existence has been documented since Ro Roman times. As far as I know, it is not practiced anywhere outside of 
this small island. When this unique means of communication was threatened with extinction, the local government required every child in school to learn how to do it. And so it has been preserved until today. A basalt structure resembling an organ is a natural miracle. The slender cliffs rise up out of the sea, and the pillars, which look very similar to organ pipes, are the remains of vast lava masses of a once powerful volcano. Over time, erosion exposed the rocks, forming them into a natural work of art. Christopher Columbus made La Homera his last port of call before crossing the Atlantic in 1492. He stopped there to replenish his crew's wine and water, and he intended on staying just about three or four days, but he became romantically involved with the governor's daughter, and he ended up staying an entire month. When he finally sailed, she gave him cutting, cuttings of sugar cane and uh, that became the first sugar cane to reach the new world. So I guess we have love to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to cause all of the sugar that we're enjoying. La Palma is called the Fair Isle because of its fabulous landscape. Santa Cruz is one of the prettiest harbors among the islands and it's very easy to uh, explore on foot. And this is the second Santa Cruz, of course. A short stroll along the Maritime Avenue promenade will take you to the lovely old quarter around Plaza de España, which has a 16th century fountain and town hall, a magnificent Renaissance church, and a market where you can snack on local delicacies and pick up distinctive pottery. The island's most spectacular volcanic crater has been designated a national park. Its night skies are so clear that a major observatory has been built here. Earlier, when I described the seven islands that make up the Canary Islands, I left one out. There are only six on this map, and I don't know if anybody counted or noticed, but I saved El Hero Island for last because for a long time, Europeans considered its western end to be the end of the world. And it was. It was the end of the known world. This island was a pleasant surprise for me because it had references that it was an island of pure lava, but uh, nothing could be further from reality. No wonder it was declared a biosphere reserve to preserve a huge natural heritage, both cultural and landscape. This island has an intriguing past and a bright future ahead of us because of some interesting local happenings now. It could become completely energy self-sufficient by using the constant steady trade wind breeze to harvest wind energy and to use alternative energies. One of the protected species on the island is nearly extinct and it's this giant lizard. The species was once present throughout much of the island but it's now confined to just a very few small areas of cliff with very sparse vegetation. It's omnivorous, uh, meaning that it eats both plants and insects. The visit includes a tour of the museum showing the lifestyle of the first European inhabitants to this island. In this area, there is also a hillside with steep lava, which is colonized by species known locally as the canary juniper, completely bent over by the wind that blows all of the time. Near the village of La Rastinga is an impressive language of solidified lava with the strangest forms looking like waves and braids and coils of rope. El Hero has the largest number of volcanoes in the Canaries with over 500 open sky cones 
another 300 covered by the most recent outflows, and some 70 caves and volcanic galleries. Over the past few months, there's been worry about a major volcanic eruption. An underwater volcano just 70 meters off the coast of El Hero has been spewing rocks, debris, and gas since early last July. Concerns were further provoked by a swarm of more than 10,000 tremors over the course of four months that have been continuously intensifying to a Richter magnitude of 3.4. There has been a significant increase in international attention to these events because according to Fox News, there's a chance to witness a very rare birth of an island. Scientists believe that the magma that's moving upwards will eventually break through the crust, forming a new island, just as the other Canary Islands have in the past, and allowing the scientists to see just exactly, exactly how that happens. By the second century AD, the Greek cartographer Ptolemy considered this western end of the island as the end of the known world. In 1634, this point was officially set as the prime meridian, and it functioned there until 1884, when it was replaced by the new one that passes through Greenwich. And that's why we have Greenwich Mean Time instead of Hero Mean Time today. To reach the area that was once the edge of the known world, you have to drive down a minor road, which then turns into an unclassified road, and after that into a dirt track. Your mobile phone has no signal here, and you truly feel as if you've come to the end of the world. The monument itself is very modest. It's just a block of concrete with half an iron globe poking out of it. But it's amazing to think that you are the most westerly of the five million people anywhere in the European Union. The local tourist office will give you a very pretty little certificate to say that you've been there to the end of the world, and you don't actually have to go. If you tell them they, that you have, they'll take your word for it. We did go, <laughs> and we have the certificate. And so, as the sun sets at the end of the world, we say adios to this Spanish archipelago and get ready for our next adventure, which I'll share uh, my next lecture. It's going to be tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. right here in the Tropical Theater. And as always, I hope that when you go to dinner tonight and you're talking about what you did today, you will tell your dinner companions what a great time we're having in here. I would still like to see these audiences grow, although I'm very gratified to see so many of you here with me this afternoon. Check this evening's cruise compass. Uh, as always, to make sure that they haven't changed it, because sometimes that happens. But as far as I know, we're scheduled for 10 o'clock every morning. I'll be focusing tomorrow on Cadiz and Andalusia with all of the information that you'll need to get a sense of the flavor of that wonderful area, along with some specifics about buses and trains and all of those kinds of things, too. And don't forget that tomorrow afternoon, I will have a great lecture on genealogy with lots of my little stories and a great deal of information about how to begin a search if you are new to the field, how to continue your search if you've already started and you're stuck, and with lots of ideas for uh, ways, if you're never going to do your own genealogy, that you can prepare things that you have so that if one of your children or grandchildren come along later and want to do it, at least the materials will be there for them. This concludes um, this part of the lecture. I want to thank the technical crew. I think it's much better with the lights down today, yes? yes. Good. Uh, I will give them my thanks for that and my thanks to you as well. And that is such a nice, hand, a nice sound to hear. I appreciate it. And don't forget when you see me up and around, thumbs up. Any questions? Boy, I'm really thorough. There usually aren't many. Yes, ma'am. We have a conflict in the morning, and I understand this is on TV sometimes. Uh, we wish it were. As, as far as I know, it is not being projected on TV. It's, it's unfortunate. Uh, choices. <laughs> we have come.